Hello, my lovely morbid friends. How are you today? So I hope you're having a lovely day and I hope you continue to have a lovely day. I might disturb it just a little bit. So today we're going to be talking about J. Frank Hickey. Now, who is he, you may ask? He is an American child molester and serial killer. He has also been dubbed the postcard killer. So this is going to be another vintage true crime case. And I hope you are interested. And let's get into today's case, shall we? So John Frank Hickey was born in Lowell, Massachusetts on 29th of October of 1865. He was born to Irish immigrants, Michael J. Hickey and Mary Ann McGrath. He was baptized as a Roman Catholic at the St. Patrick's Church in Lowell, and it was only two blocks away from where his parents lived. Now, after he would be arrested in the future, he claimed that his father was physically abusive to him, and this was one of the reasons why he killed. So, also to know, in his early teens, Hickey joined Lowell's first congregational church, which was on Kirk Street. And he also would become an official at the Lowell YMCA and the Christian Endeavor in town. So, this lovely man, lovely, lovely man, he would commit his first murder when he was 18. So, on, the, on September 1st, 1883, he, being 18 year old, being 18 at the time, Hickey would contact the police and he would say that he found it, the 34-year-old pharmacist, Edwin Morey, dead on the floor at McGimmon's drugstore. Now, this is where he worked with him. Hickey would claim that Morey had been more, like, despondent. He was incoherent at the time due to his alcoholism. And he had been trying to help his coworker regain sobriety. So, as the doctor believed that Maury had taken poison, his stomach was pumped, and at midnight, he shown, showed some signs of life, but he would die shortly after at 3 a.m. Years later, Hickey would admit to murdering him with laudanum, which is... I didn't... I had no idea what laudanum was at the time, and this is part of an opiate and it contains approximately it's like 10% powdered opium by weight so it's super strong super super strong <laughs> and you would dissolve this in alcohol that that's basically how you would administer it the powder would be dissolved in ethanol and then it would be administered via a needle and obviously, they're working in a drugstore, so this is something that would be on the shelves at the time. Now, he admit after admitting that he murdered him, he also said that he was afraid that if they their employer found Maury intoxicated, both of them would be fired. So that's why he said he murdered him. So... And not only was he a murderer, he also became a Freemason, or tried to. So, on his application, he listed his, well, for his application to receive the membership of a Freemason at the Masonic Lodge in Lowell, which that is the William North Masonic Lodge, and he applied in 1887, he listed his occupation as secretary of the YMCA. In 1889, he became a Master Mason, and despite any later claims, Hickey never attained the rank of a 32nd degree Freemason. Although a biographer by the name of Vance McLaughlin describes Hickey as having quit the Masons in June of 1895, there are records that tell a different story. And in March 1895, Hickey's arrested in Lowell for stealing 20 gallons of alcohol from his employer. And in response, the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts ruled Hickey a liar and profane and expelled him from all rights and privileges of Freemasonry in June. So June 12th of 1895. So 
on to our next year, so 1896, Hickey moves from Lowell, and he would never live there again. Between 1896 and 1902, he drifted around Canada and the northeastern U.S., and he would work various industrial jobs. So, on December 10th, 1902, Hickey would encounter a man named Michael Cruck. He was an 11-year-old newspaper vendor. When Cruck offered to sell him a newspaper, Hickey responded that he would purchase all of them if the boy would follow him into Central Park. Now, obviously... We're in Central Park now. He's in New York City. Which, if you don't know where Central Park is, it's an urban park in New York City that's located between the Upper West and Upper East Side of Manhattan. And it's the fifth largest park in the city. So, when Crook did so, Hickey strangled him, left his body with the newspaper bundle under his head, and the coroner, after they discovered him, he would examine the body, but he found no evidence of sexual assault. The coroner in quest ruled that Michael R. Crook met his death by being strangled by someone, by some person or persons unknown to his jury. So basically, it's somebody that he didn't know. On December 12, 1902, his body would be released from the morgue, and he was eventually buried at the Brooklyn, Washington Jewish Cemetery. It wouldn't be... There wouldn't be, like, a close time between that first murder and his second, like, so, his second murder and his third murder. I call it his first murder because, I mean, it was a younger boy. So, his next murder he would commit wouldn't be until 1911, so that's a nine-year difference in time. So, October 12th, 1911, Hickey is then employed as a steel plant supervisor in Lackawanna, New York. Now, if you don't know where Lackawanna is, it's in Erie County in New York. And this is when he noticed a seven-year-old named Joey Joseph playing with his, like, at his father's furniture, furniture store. Later, when Joey was making mud puddles with a friend in a street near his house, Hickey motioned to them to join him. He gave Joey a few pennies to buy candy for himself and his friend, and upon Joey's return, Hickey abruptly told his friend that it was time to, for him to go home. Hickey then took Joey by the hand and led him to an outhouse behind a saloon on Ridge Road. This is when Hickey would strangle Joey to the point where he was unconscious. He would molest him and then strangle him to death. Hickey would then dump the boy's body into the outhouse pit. So... Despite assistance from the Buffalo Police Department, the investigation into Joey Joseph's disappearance led nowhere. Then, on October 30th, 1911, a postcard was delivered to the Lackawanna Police Chief, uh, and his name was Chief Gilson. And it read, Joseph, Joseph Joseph will be found at the bottom of a water closet with three seats, back of the saloon near Doyle's on Ridge Road. A crazed, a drunk, crazed brain done the deed in remorse and sorrow for the parents is bringing results that will soon come to an end the demon whiskey will then have one more victim making four in all drag the closet with the three seats so this gives where joey's body is i swear this i like i understand that I understand why people are the way they are, but when it comes to killing a like younger kids and stuff like that, it's eh. no, I just eh. I just don't ugh. I don't understand it. I don't understand the I I just I don't understand the concept of it. You know what I mean? It just I don't know. I don't know. So, Hickey would continue to taunt his victims' families and the police by sending them correspondence of postcards about his crimes and about his victims. And he enjoyed knowing that they could read, they could be read by anybody while they were en route. And these postcards eventually formed a net that would get him arrested. So, 
So Jos Joey Joseph's body would have never been found unless the postcards happened. So some of the messages on these postcards described the heinous crime that he committed against Joey Joseph and others expressed an obvious form of like false remorse for killing him and some of them actually described how he enjoyed his control of the situation while he killed him. Finally, in one of the letters that was sent, the writer gave police directions to the body and the next day, the day after, authorities dug up the skeletal remains from the pit of the outhouse and this was near Joey's home so he wasn't far from home. As this case was brought into the media, a young psychiatrist named Nelson Kid Wilson published a detailed description of what the killer might look like, and his profile was so close to the truth that prosecution there was a po prosecution team that later hired him. And also at this, with no real leads, the police decided to publish copies of the postcards to the local newspaper, and almost immediately several people contacted the authorities because they recognized the handwriting as an eccentric drunkard named J. Frank Hickey. After he was arrested, Hickey confessed to three murders and numerous sexual assaults on children, along with Joey Joseph, the 10-year-old newsboy, Michael Crook, and then, obviously, Edwin Morey. Hickey is also suspected of at least 12 other murders. During the two decades he roamed New England, dozens of children went missing or were found murdered. At least two other, there was two other serial murderers around at the time. That was Albert Fish and then Peter Kudzanowski. I can never say his last name right. And they were also active in the same area at the same time that J. Frank Hickey was. So it's like, they're n not exactly sure if he killed other kids or if it was the other ones. So he was also a hopeless alcoholic. Um he was always kind of like weirdly happy when he was drunk but and while he was sober like he was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde he was very different when he was drunk and when he was sober but when he was drunk this is when he confided to detectives that he harbored a secret sexual attraction for children and most of his numerous assaults were completely spontaneous, like he wasn't expecting to do it. And when he was tipping the demon rum, as he called it, he claimed he couldn't control himself. <sighs> what a lovely man, huh? What a lovely man. So he would not be sentenced to death. He instead was convicted of second degree, second degree murder and he was sent to Auburn prison. And when they when the jurors interviewed as to their verdict one said would you shoot a dog because he acts this way and the jury thought he was insane but hickey was way too dangerous to be placed in a mental institution where he might escape or be released so the second degree murder conviction kept him locked up until he died which he obviously he would die while he's in prison on May 8th, 1922. So he was sentenced to life in 1912 and he would die 10 years later in prison. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's true crime story. I know this is a very weird one, especially when it comes to this. Nobody really likes to talk about child molesters ever or think of them, but because this is such a weird vintage case, I wanted to cover it because it's another one that's not really broadcasted or talked about quite a bunch. So, and anywho, I hope you guys come back for more. Don't forget to like this, hit the subscribe button, turn your bell notification on to all, and I will see you guys tomorrow in our next day of the 25 Days of True Crime. Bye, guys. It's white outside